I actually interviewed at Google twice. Uh, the first time I failed utterly, and the second time uh, I got through. So uh, there's many paths into interviewing at Google. Hi, I'm Molly from Springboard, and I'm here with Michael, a data scientist at Google. Michael, thanks so much for being here. Thanks for having me. You started off with a PhD in physics, and now you're a data scientist. How did that transition happen? Yeah, so I think uh, in physics, one of the things that attracted me most to the field that I studied, which was particle physics, was um, sort of the ability to leverage computer science, mathematical modeling, and data visualization to sort of solve big questions. And uh, the longer I was in that field, the more I realized that that process of kind of problem solving with uh, those techniques and tools, uh, I actually enjoyed that more than the physics itself. So it was a natural transition for me to sort of move to a career that uh, felt like it had higher impact, a wide variety of work, and good career opportunity. And uh, data science was that, was that move for me. Before Google, you worked at Mercedes. What were some of the projects that you worked on there? Uh, the big problem that we were solving at Mercedes is basically how do you build machine learning into an environment where there's limited to no data connectivity. And so uh, one of those pieces was how do you do that in a car interface with a very low power computer like a Raspberry Pi and basically create an interface that can um, uh, customize itself to the user's needs based on context. And so this was released as MBUX in 2017. And uh, that, that was a pretty cool project because there's a lot of challenges that you would normally have to solve uh, with like you know, if you had access to a massive data set or connectivity, things like that. Great, we pulled some questions from some of our Springboard students. Um, we currently have one from Miguel, who is in our data science vertical. He asked, do you have a process for thinking about the data before you start implementing the tools? And that's a great question. And I think the, sort of the, I, I would like add another piece to that, which is that it kind of depends on where you're at. The Mercedes answer would be that um, you have to build the tools and usually, uh, the way that you approach that is you think about the, the data you have and uh, what kind of features do you have uh, and specifically uh, where where is the information hiding that sort of links your input to output and what kind of transformation do you need to apply to the data set uh, to, to enable modeling. So uh, that's what I would say. The, the key is to think about, do all your work up front I would say because models Models are kind of a dime a dozen. You know, with sklearn, you can just like, it's the same API, so you can just like model.fit a thousand times and then combine the outputs and then do a model on top of that. But uh, all, the, all the work now, I think, is how do you think about engineering features and building the model into a pipeline? Another one of our data science students wants to know a little bit more about your interview process at Google. What was that like? Um, and how did you search for your job? So. I actually interviewed at Google twice. Uh, the first time I failed utterly, and the second time uh, I got through. So uh, there's many paths into interviewing at Google, and I think a pretty common one, if you don't know anyone at Google, is that a recruiter reaches out to you. And uh, I think once you have a job and that's all posted on LinkedIn and your LinkedIn profile looks pretty good, and uh, the recruiter's gonna, like you're gonna get contacted by Facebook, Amazon, Google, uh, Netflix. Like they're gonna, they're gonna talk to you. So when you take the recruiter intake process, uh, usually what they will do is they'll kind of hold your hand through the whole process. The first piece is a technical screen. Um, if the recruiter feels like that's unnecessary, they may move you directly to an on-site. I've interviewed at a lot of companies, and uh, one of the things that I always do is I just ask the recruiter, uh, what are the metrics that you will be evaluating me on in these interviews, and what topics will be covered? And I think some people feel that like that's off limits, but like this, you know, this isn't like school. You're allowed to like ask what's on the test before you get the test. So I encourage people to do that. It's not cheating, no. Yeah, it's not cheating. Um, I think a lot of people, when they interview, they get really fixated on, I got to get the right answer. And they maybe a little freeze because they get really nervous. And these are like totally natural reactions. Um, I would say the interview process, like if you think of it more of like a performance, uh, you'll have like a much better time. You'll, you'll probably enjoy it more. And, uh, you know, 
I think the outcome will be better. We also have a question from Guy, who is one of our community managers. Um, he wanted to know, how do you develop a knack for data wrangling? Do you have a process for that? Honestly, I think that data wrangling is going to be one of the things that uh, is replaced by modeling. Uh, there's a whole field called uh, data learning, where basically a model tries to learn. You, you, you have a data set, and it maybe is like super messy, and you just uh, throw that into a data learning model, and, and the model figures out what's important. OK, but that's not the question. The question is, how do you develop an intuition for data? And so um, it's tricky, because sometimes it, I would say it depends on the size of the data set. When the data set becomes very large in terms of like the number of observations or features, uh, really the number of features, uh, you know, I, I work on projects that regularly have, you know, tens of thousands of features, right? And so that just can't fit into your head as a human being. So the way that you, I think the only way that in that space that you can develop an intuition for data is actually from a modeling perspective. So you try models, you understand what over and under fitting is and how to tune your model. And that, and because, you know, oftentimes there's just one outcome. And I think everybody can understand what like one number means in their mind. In the case where you have a smaller number of features, uh, I think the best way to build an intuition for that is to, to just try it. So there's this uh, data set that I send out to people that's from the UCI machine learning repository, and it's the auto MPG data set. And I love it because it has like a mix of categorical features, it has numeric features, it has numeric features that are really actually categorical features. And then the, the goal is like, can you model the miles per gallon of these cars? And it's such, it's so rich and it's so small, there's only like 300 observations and like eight features, but you can do a lot with it. And so I think the crucial piece to developing intuition is to practice. And if you're not practicing, you can't develop that intuition. Just to kind of like put the nail on that, uh, you need to like be comfortable with handling categorical features. You need to understand how to turn numerical features into categorical features. You need to understand how to treat numerical features. You need to understand what normalization is and when, what models are robust in feature normalization and what models it doesn't matter for. And there's no like easy way, just, I would just say try it. And when people ask me like, help me prepare for data science interviews, I just tell them to like do data challenges over and over again. And then like come talk to me and tell me like how you feel about those data challenges, you know. So. All right, we also have another question from one of our students, Andrew. Um, can you give us an example of a problem that has multiple solutions? How would you go about solving that? Yeah, I would break that down into sort of like the agnostic point of view where like you just do model stacking and you don't even think about it. And then there's like the point of view where you go ahead and like really think about it. So the first thing that you could do and you should try because it's for free, because computing is free basically, is take all those models and build a model on top of the outputs of those models and uh, see if the your accuracy metrics on this on this kind of ensembled model is higher than like any of the models individually. The other piece, if you have a bunch of models uh, and you want to pick, you can only pick one, uh, there can only be one, uh, you you have to sort of uh, take a step back and ask uh, what's important. So oftentimes in data science, um, you are going to be like working closely with people in business, and certain things are, are really important. And that's like a, a big theme anyway. Now let's say that you have a bunch of models. Uh, you know, models themselves have different properties. Like let's just take, let's say you want to do classification, and you uh, have a random forest or an, an ensemble model like random forest, or you have logistic regression, which is like you know the canonical uh, classification solution. Um, it doesn't mean it's the right one; it's just the one everybody knows. Well, in that case, uh, if the if the decision boundary between those classes is the thing that's really important, and that boundary has is like has meaning, well, you don't really want to use something like logistic regression or sorry, uh, like random forest because there's no guarantee that you get a clean boundary between classes, whereas logistic regression uh, enforces that. So uh, that's one category is what are the business needs from the models? The other piece is, you know, whenever you do a modeling, you should have your model evaluation metrics and you should know 
uh, what metrics are important for the exercise. So back with classification again, you know, there's this, there's this idea of like, you can talk about the accuracy, so how often you get it right. You can talk about precision, and you can talk about recall. And maybe uh, the business needs you to have a high precision, but recall doesn't matter. Or maybe recall is the thing that matters and precision doesn't matter. So those are all kind of like soft ways that you make determinations. The final answer is, let's say you have you know, different models with different outputs. You should ha already have your model evaluation metrics like down pat, like if it's regression, maybe like your RMS or something. And you just pick the one that has the highest accuracy or the lowest error, and you just wash your hands and move on. So I mean, a lot of times the business problems that you solve in data science, they're like, you just need an 80% solution. And if you stay up all night wondering about which model to pick, like I would just say don't, just pick one and explain, like document it and explain your decision and you can always come back to it later. We have one last question from a student, Corey. He asks, how important is SQL in comparison to Python in 2019? Ah, uh, that's an interesting question because uh, I think people love uh, putting SQL on this like mega pedestal as like a core thing that all data scientists have to use. Uh, my opinion on it is that if your data science, if your data set fits into memory, um, it like literally doesn't matter what you do because uh, computers are fast and human brains are slow, and you're not going to notice like the difference between doing something in uh, pandas data frame versus an R data frame versus SQL. However, um, it is like you have to know SQL. Like the the the, the universe has decided that in data science interviews you must know SQL. So. Um, uh, the question is what's important in 2019? I would say if your data set doesn't fit into memory, then you have to use SQL. And if it does, it doesn't matter. And there's like a million caveats to that statement that we could talk about. Wonderful. Well, um, Michael, thank you so much for being here today. We really appreciate you sharing all of your knowledge with us and it was wonderful getting to speak with you. Yeah, likewise. Thanks for inviting me out.